Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. So, hey, if you just press play, you're missing out on 47 minutes of extra, extra content. This extra content is absolutely exclusive to Patreon supporters who support at $3 a month. Um, this 30, this 47 minutes of content is uh, the two of us. I'm joined with by Hector Murray. We're, we're talking about um, where is the MCU right now? It's 2024. We're recording in May, kind of mid-May. Uh, we're in the year where only one Marvel movie, Marvel Disney movie, is coming out. And then, ironically, Sony is trying to put out like three this year. What a disaster. With Marvel, with Disney Marvel taking their break, um, we were just thinking, I was just curious, like, wh- where do we feel like we are with Marvel? How do we feel about how last year went, 2023? That was Quantumania, Guardians 3, the Marvels, uh, and then a bunch of the shows, too. Um, is there any motivation and excitement for fans? Uh, is Deadpool going to be what what is riding on Deadpool? Do we think it's going to do well, at least financially uh, and just so much more? Go to the Patreon. The Patreon is going to be linked in the show notes down below. Let's just uh, let's just get into it because we know you really press play to hear us talk about your line April um, and hear us talk. Hear me talk with uh, my special guest, too. Um, before I introduce him, we are doing a it's not a movie, so I'll call it a TV show discussion wherein we're going to just chat about the show. Um, your line April. We're going to talk the first half of this episode. That's about 20 to 40 minutes. Um, that's going to be no spoilers. We'll talk about vibe the atmosphere, um, the material, the content without specifics. And then the latter half of the show will be spoiler specific. I will have a transition in the middle for when we do that. Um, So if you're interested or not interested, I guess you'll decide whether you'll keep listening by then. But uh, apart from the format of the show, yeah, I'm joined uh, joined by Hector from Faith and Fandom. What is going on, Hector? Oh, you know, just still reeling from all the girthy Marvel content. Yeah, I feel like after that, now we have to pivot to talking about some sort of Marvel movie that may or may not exist. But yeah, Faith and Fandom, this is a whole thing. I wrote down a list of a bunch of stuff that I basically could find and collect about what you did. And I was just like shocked because I kept finding new things, new thing and new thing. And then I realized rather than compiling it all with a lot of details, I cut it down to just some quick bite sized stuff so that I could just ask you questions before we get into your line April, just so we can learn some about what you do. Um, So in general, broadly speaking, what is Faith and Fandom? Uh, Faith and Fandom broadly is a, I don't use the term outreach per se, but like uh, Faith and Fandom started because I wanted to find a way to help faith curious geeks have an onboard to ask questions and kind of start a journey Mm -hmm. towards God and geek passionate believers to have a place that actually nurture and grow them spiritually in a place where they might feel like they have to neglect their passions to actually be recognized. The big thing that kind of kicked it off was that I was going to these big comic cons like that had like 30,000 people at them. And I'd walk this whole thing for three or four days and never see one thing that was spiritually encouraging. Mm -hmm. I would meet people who I knew were believers, but like there was nothing that they could connect with in that capacity. And, you know, it was just, I did that for like three years and I was like, hold on, I'm going to do something. And just kind of started with that. When did uh, it finally when did it turn into this, like what you're doing now? 2013 was really kind of when it 
officially started being a thing. And um, I had gone to cons for a couple of years. I'd cosplayed a little bit, done some different stuff. And that year I ended up um, doing a cosplay contest video, like where I videoed every person in cosplay at the show mm-hmm. and just had some good conversations with them and stuff. And like, uh, like I just, by the end of that year or end of that con, which was like father's day, 2013, I said that, you know, like I'm going to come back here next year. I'm going to set up a booth. I'm going to write a geeky devotional. Um, because like if I don't, I don't want to annoy people. I don't want to force anything on anybody, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. if somebody sees like something like what I'm creating and is interested and wants to have a conversation, I want it to be able to be available. So I was like, I'm going to create a book. I'm going to do this. I'm going to set up a booth. And the, the whole deal was, um, it was supposed to be a one-time project. (laughs) Like it was literally supposed to be one weekend of my life. I started writing the book literally right after I said that a, summer camp in tennessee hit me up and said hey would you come to a superhero week of camp for us and i was like can i do whatever i want and they're like absolutely (laughs) (laughs) and so i literally wrote the first eight chapters of the first faith faith and fandom book as that week of camps messages cool that's awesome and then i did a sci-fi section and video game section and i uh did that started that in summer of 2013 and published a book, made some kind of terrible meme shirts and <laughs> uh, commissioned an artist to make some meme prints, like cool. some biblical meme prints and uh, set up my first booth. And it was supposed, literally supposed to be, I was going to be there for father's day weekend, 2014. Mm-hmm. And that was going to be it. I was going to be done. Like, I was like, cool check on to the next thing. <laughs> and the response I got that one weekend like was like, oh, people actually care. This is something people connect with. And by the end of that weekend, I had three other shows invite me to be at their show because they cool. wanted it there. And it's just kind of grown from there to like actually having church services at cons and being a guest at some shows and getting to go to San Diego. And it's just kind of like grown from there. But the 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 essence has always, whether it's in, podcasts or comics or books or whatever else the essence is just to be able to be a place where people who are curious about faith uh, can kind of jump in and test their waters and people who already are believers can just be encouraged even through their passions. Having like interacted with a lot of people who are doing similar ideas, right? Like they're, they're observing that like people who uh, the, the first thought that came to my mind is like tech oriented, not tech, like big tech, like, you know, big money, big tech, big uh, Silicon Valley stuff, but like tech oriented in terms of likes, technology, video games, the digital sphere, its faces. They're usually like places that like, I feel like the church has routinely had difficulty in. And that kind of makes sense, right? Like it's every 10 to 15 years, the church is always a little behind and then it catches up or it doesn't quite know how to use it. And that's fine. I think there's a lot of orientation of like the church wants to be careful about that. But it also means that there's opportunity that might be missed for not church, but church offshoots or things that churches can support uh, in reaching out to people. And a lot of those programs that I've noticed have podcasts, have websites, do YouTube. But I was particularly interested in the fact that you also put out a lot of books. And it's more than just the one you announced. I think you said like eight at least. And so like, what were, was that just like you saw that it was a useful tool for people and you kept producing new ones? Or was it your own personal interest was like, I just actually really enjoy doing this, so I'm going to do more of it? Where, where did that come from? So connecting spiritual themes and biblical stuff to pop culture has always been in my my mind. Mm-hmm. Like that's always been the way my brain operates. It's just never like really been a functional avenue for it. Like being in full time ministry and stuff like that, you're not. There's not a lot of places where I can like, hey, can we talk about this anime real quick on a Sunday morning? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's usually just not a smooth thing, and you know, occasionally a church might do a movie series or something, but that's still even then, it's not functional. Yes. So it's always there, but kind of floating in me, and I knew that I couldn't be the only person that connected with stuff that way. Mm-hmm. So I wrote the first book initially, like I said, to be an outreach, and then once I saw that it was functional. Then like, you know, I kind of intentionally kept going with it, but I was ready to quit by the second book, like hands down. Um, (laughs) What in particular? Like why? It's one of those things of uh, 
I guess it got successful and I had to do more work and I was tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's the so, best reason. Oh, this is uh, too much. I'm done. <laughs> well, so I put out book one, and uh, before book two came out, I got hired by Clever Movies, which is you know eventually became like Fandom Entertainment and Screen Junkies at different respective times. Mm-hmm. I got hired by Clever Movies to be their resident geek writer. One of their hosts, who now does like Taco Bell commercials and stuff like now, um, like <laughs> picked up my first book. Their said, host was a Chihuahua. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> Got him. <laughs> uh, but like that's the last thing I've seen her do was a Taco Bell commercial. Um, <laughs> but like uh, she picked up my first book and says it sounds like you really know what you're talking about on your geek content. Um, and at that point in time, their network was hiring attractive people to debate geek stuff, but they were basically just reading Wikipedia. Ah, interesting. Huh? So they had on screen talent that had no idea what they were talking about. Yeah. 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 So they wanted me to write their stuff. So they hired me to start writing for them. And so I'm turning in script after script. I did 130 scripts (sighs) for them. And so it was like constantly writing for them to the point where I'm like, I don't have bandwidth or mental space to actually write for me or to write what's passionate about. And so like, here's the thing, like the script writing was paying for all the comic cons that were starting to happen now. So I could, yeah, I could, I could go to cons and pay for table spaces and order books because the scripts were paying for it. And Mm. um, so I got the second book out and literally was quitting at that point in time. Like I was like done. And I told like one person at a con and her name's Kimberly. And I t- pointed out every time we talk, <laughs> I told Kimberly I was going to quit. And she literally like grabbed me. She's like, uh. she's like, don't you dare. <laughs> she's like, people need this. I need uh. this. Don't you dare stop. And she like, uh-huh. like threatened to manhandle me. Now, like, I'm not saying I continued just for that, but I was like, oh, wait, you, you actually care about this. And so it became a thing of like, I knew that if I was going to keep doing cons, I couldn't show up to the same because if I was doing a circuit like this show, this show, this show and it's circling around, I couldn't show up to the same show a year later with the same 90 page book. Yes. Yeah. That would <laughs> and it'd be good. functional. Yeah. So my goal was to have a new book every year. And, uh, and I honestly was on track to keeping up one a year at that point in time. And, but book, book seven happened, the pandemic. And so at that point in time, I started putting all the devotionals online for free, like just putting mm-hmm. them up on the website and where anybody can read it. And so like now, every time I write something, um, I'll put it out as a, blog first then instantly record it as a podcast audiobook chapter um which also helps me edit because once i'm saying it out loud i'm like oh that was stupid yeah on. yep <laughs> uh, and so i've just been doing that and now um and i've done some other stuff not just the geeky devotionals but like um i today like i was like sending something to a show i'm going to be at in august and like i have 20 books like not just so cool. Um, not just Faith and Fanda, but like we have a children's book. I've written a comic book. I wrote somebody else's comic book. I wrote an issue for so for somebody else's comic book. Some random devotionals. Um, just different stuff like that. But that's just kind of been the heart of it. That is really cool. Well, Faith and Fanda, guys, check it out. Hector, where where can people find it right now? Um, was the website preferred? Spotify, iTunes, whatever. Um, you can find the podcast wherever you find podcasts. Um, you should be able to. Um, but uh, faithandfandom dot org uh, will link you to. Uh, I want to say at this point it's a hun- like one hundred and seventy geeky devotionals maybe 200 now. Um, and you can read all of the main books for free on our websites. Uh, if you go to our podcast channel, which is uh, faith and fandom dot podbean dot com, you can find, you can search audio and pull up all the audio chapters from the books. But uh, basically in all the books are also on Amazon and all the places. But if you look up faith and fandom, you'll probably find me. There is some dude who has faith and fandom dot com. And I want it. So, <laughs> campaign yeah i'm coming now (laughs) i'm loving i'm lovingly coming for you bro Uh, (laughs) hey don't forget 
There's a lot of fun content missing from this episode because you're not listening on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support for $3 a month to gain access to uncut episodes with upwards of 40 minutes of bonus content each. You'll thank me later. Uh, so, hey, if you guys tuned in, you're tuning in um, for for both that and you're tuning in now for uh, Your Lie in April. Um, so whenever I reach out to guests or potential guests for the podcast, I always touch base and I say, first off, tell me a bit of the shows that you're interested in. Tell me a bit of the types of things you're interested in. Tell me what you're not interested in, so on and so forth. And they get back to me. Um, but because I was trying to get guests specifically for Annie May, because uh, I like to do anime in May or anime adjacent stuff, um, I had reached out and said, Hector, I was like, hey, I just need some anime in particular too. You got any recommendations? And I think one of the ones you sent in particular was You Are Lie in April. Um, this show came out probably around the time I stopped watching anime religiously. Um, there was a long time where I just kept watching stuff all the time and then kind of just winded down and we're getting anything pretty much after 2016, anything after the season Kimono Friends came out. That is pretty much when I stopped watching. So um, so we are getting there now. And uh, Your Lie in April is one of the top most popular shows on my anime list. Uh, I feel like that's always a good barometer for checking out what's most popular. And I know you had recommended this to me. Would, do you want to uh, introduce Your Lie in April for our listeners? Sure. And I'll just say this too. Had the timing worked out a little bit later, I would have absolutely been talking about delicious in dungeon instead yeah i've heard that's pretty good dude it's it's, really it's, good. it's my weekly happy thing really like when, uh, when, that's great like they're like 20 episodes deep when i'm done here tonight i'm watching this week's episode <laughs> um but uh you're lying april uh so it's an anime about two uh musically gifted young people with their own trauma and baggage that have a kind of what's the word uh the lovers that never connect. Um, yeah, it's like um, it's like unrequited in a way. Yeah, uh, unrequited love, yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like that, but it's uh, it's music, it's trauma, it's longing, and uh, in a weird teenage package. And I I got introduced to it because my teenage daughter when I were driving to a comic con, and she's literally just sitting in the passenger seat weeping. And I'm like, no, what? I'm like, what the what the crap is wrong with you? And she's like, I'm crying about an anime I watched. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Was she she's watching like a, it then or was she just no, thinking about it? No, okay, she was so just she was thinking, thinking about it. <laughs> That's awesome. She had like finished it the day before. Oh, man. <laughs> and, but she was still sad about it. And like she was just crying. And I'm like, what the crap are you? What's wrong with you? And <laughs> she's telling me all about this. And I'm like, dude, it can't be that emotional. And then like, you know, I want to say two or three months later went by and I walked in. And she's watching it over from the beginning. I'm, like, I'm going to sit down with you. <laughs> And um, I sat down and we watched the entire thing in one sitting. Wow. One sitting. That's that's impressive. And I'm like, oh, my heart. OK, so and literally I watched this because my teenage daughter was really into it and I don't regret watching it. And uh, it's I think it's got a lot of potent stuff to it. But, yeah, that's that's your and I in April. Yeah, and now two adult men are going to be talking about your line April yeah. for the next hour and a half, maybe an hour. So that'll be we're we're definitely the uh, yeah. Let, uh, let's Robert talk about for, teenage romance. <laughs> Yay! This is. Um, at the very least, uh, I do know listeners are aware that I am a big fan of teen dramas and teen romance. I don't know why, but it's like that combination of high school envy and the coming of age nature of storytelling that I just find quite compelling. Um, yeah, like like you described, your line April very much teen drama, teen romance causing tears that is definitely a consistent thing the characters here are quite simple like you said musically gifted we have one character who uh, kose who is our lead who plays piano he's a prodigy but at some point he just stopped and we're gonna then as the show continues learn out why and it's very early on we learn that there's uh, trauma regarding his mother that kind of has uh, made it difficult for him to play music and then Cowdy, who is the uh, female lead of the show, who plays violin, and the two do shows together or a show together, um, but she is also seemingly hiding a particular possible medical thing that is going on. Uh, and of course, the title, Your Lie in April. So the whole show, you're going, When does it come up? What's the lie? What is it? There are some other side characters, uh, only two others that particularly really matter, and a third one who I wish 
we I don't remember ever hearing their name, but I actually thought they were one of the more interesting characters, even though they're hard side character. But you have Subaki, who is the um, the neighbor who has grown up with um, uh, Kosei his whole life, and she's been kind of like an older sister, him a younger brother. But she has also unrequited love for him. And then Watari, who is uh, Kosei's male friend, who is currently dating Kaori. Um, so those dynamics, if you are not an anime fan or have not watched the show, you will undoubtedly forget about all of the dynamics of the friendships. Don't worry, we will keep you up to pace. In particular, or not even in particular, just in general, what did you think of Your Lie in April? I'm a big music person. Mm -hmm. So I love any kind of storytelling that really uses music in an interesting medium, like Scott Pilgrim, Kubo and the Two Strings. Yeah, Scott like, Pilgrim's great. Yeah. Kubo and the Two Strings, dude, is like one of my favorite pieces of anything ever. And But I, I love musical creativity and the use of musical creativity in Your Lie in April. I think it's kind of unparalleled in any anime I've watched. Like, I don't think I've seen anything use music as well as they did in that. And what cracks me up is imagine reading the manga of this. Yeah, I wonder how it would flow. Because I was thinking about this in particular, especially with the scene towards the end. I'm opening my anime list right now because you reminded me of another thing, too. Um, because uh, there's a manga that I remember reading that similarly also kind of has music as part of the story. Um, and very heavily so. And yeah, even at the end of that particular manga, I remember like weeping as if I was hearing the music itself. So I suppose it would just be as the characters are so compelling or as the material is so compelling, you just hear the music uh, in the way that the characters are also trying to compel one another to hear it too. I, I don't know. What, what do you think? I'm going to tell you straight up. I don't have that kind of imagination. <laughs> Like, yeah, I, yeah, if, I guess. Yeah, because one, my brain's not creative enough just to whip out classical music randomly, because mm -hmm. I feel like in the manga, it actually told you what song they were playing. So I guess you could homework it. But like, yeah, like I, I don't have the emotional or the mental capability to imagine music. And here's the thing. It wasn't just the music. It was the visuals and the colors that goes with the music. Yeah, there's a lot. But I just yeah. I really liked the visuals of a lot of things, the way that they used like the cherry blossoms were always a big deal. The colors uh, of stuff changing was a big deal. Uh, there's some cat. There's a thing with the cat like in the storytelling a little bit later on yes. the way the yeah. the way that water and the music notes play out there's just a lot of the the ties of the visual medium and i'm also a, a sucker for good lines of dialogue mm -hmm. i'm like i have a whole like roster of quotes i'm just like that are just like gorgeous quotes from this and like the writing especially on some of the things just like like not spoilers but like uh no yeah go ahead yeah w which ones line like uh let's see Sometimes it's not the song that makes you emotional. It's the people and things that come to your mind when you hear it. How could I forget about you when everything about you has already become part of me? People want to hear songs w with the words they're afraid to say. The, the people I love, they keep on leaving me and the music that brings to my, and the music just brings to mind what I've lost. It's pretty much consistent that, yeah, there will be these quick, almost like, haiku sized they're not haiku but haiku sized lines that are really pretty densely packed with meaning and i too started to notice that and it's it's from beginning to end they are peppered in throughout the uh the dialogue in the in the show just like little judo chops of like beautiful line ha huh. out yeah yeah <laughs> they're they're in they're out and then you're left with it in a way that's like very very memorable you may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinematic Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. Yeah, I, I, I decided to go the classical route of writing down what I liked and what I don't like as my introduction to what do I think about Your Lie in April. I I like the classical music. I like the I I am just in general a fan of classical music. Uh but because the whole show has these every 3 to 4 episodes a new time like they're playing uh, in a way that's like a focus of a, a song is a focus. That was always enjoyable. I really liked it. 
Uh, I like uh, the second thing I liked was music as metaphor. I enjoyed some, but not all the musical metaphor stuff. I think episode five is right. Like in my notes, I wrote like, all right, this is it. Like, I I like this a lot. Um, I felt that was the strongest um, usage too of how the music is metaphor. So to give some background, Kose, um, he, uh, I, I, yeah, this is like episode one or two. Kose basically has correlated his playing of music and piano. He's 14. And when he was 10, uh, his mother died and he correlated uh, his mother's child abuse of him and then death to his music. And so now he is like in it, unable to hear the piano because when he does it, he essentially can't stop thinking of his mother and then the abuse. And um, this episode, he, through circumstances, forced to play piano. Um, not forced. He is coaxed into and accepts it. Um, he's kind of a, a weak little turd for like half the show until he decides to make decisions later on. And even then, there are just a few. We'll talk about that later. But um, he uh, is now playing piano and he's playing and he can hear it. And then he's like, oh, no, it's happening. And like the, the screen fades it changes. He's like transported into this like basically mind palace, this mind torture palace of his own doing. And like his mother is present there and like, she's got the scary anime face, the one that they've been using for the last 15 years. Um, and uh, he's not able to hear the keys. And I like the way that they do this. So if you've ever pl- pressed in a keyboard when it's turned off, it just sort of sounds like hollow. It sounds like a slosh. Yeah. It sounds hollow, like sloshing water in a bottle. And um, so now that's the noise that he's getting. And he also sounds, he also describes it as drowning too. So it, it just is awesome here. And you hear like the music faded and it's still going on but it's like they're gone um it's a great episode episode five is awesome stuff uh in my opinion i think it's the best episode of the show this moment is just really cool and it comes back a few other times as like he's experiencing that drama in different ways um and i just yeah i, I thought that was all particularly really neat uh what, what did you think of the showcasing of the music as metaphor though just seeing how it plays out throughout the whole thing like from beginning to end is like, I thought it was brilliant. And I really, that's honestly why I was saying like, I don't know how well it would have translated in print or in even live action because the music as the metaphor with the visuals, like made all the difference for me. Mm -hmm. But like just the way that the music was also like the whole gateway for trauma, for healing, for connection, Mm -hmm. for relationship. There was just a lot of where, the music went with it that uh and the playing of it and that calories was wounded hope and that uh that kose's was like muddled anguish yeah and and like the fact that she was like the whole thing was her him her bring her music and her presence bringing him out of that and mm-hmm. i also um <laughs> learned like of a term uh, recently there was an article. So like my, like, uh, my favorite, uh, movie of all time is almost famous. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like Cameron Crowe also made a movie called Elizabeth town yeah. there. And then you, we've already mentioned Scott Pilgrim. Uh, are, somebody, can I guess the term? Yeah. I think I know which, are you going to talk about manic pixie dream girl? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cause I uh, have thoughts on that too. <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> oh, and ahead, and that was, and that was the thing was like, um, like I feel like Calorie has a bit of the manic pixie dream girl thing. A bit. Oh, that's a lot. God, sorry. Go I, ahead. I, 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 listen, my kid's gonna listen. <laughs> my kid's gonna listen to this at some point, so I've got to be nice about it. Um, because uh, I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> his daughter. Because in a couple minutes, I'm gonna have some thoughts that you may not enjoy. Oh, and, and listen, I, I'm not saying this to be like uh, she. She read over your notes. Uh, oh, she did she, of uh, of just okay. the opening paragraph. Okay, like and like you know she read over your notes and she's like, "Excuse me, <laughs> what?" <laughs> she's uh, like, and she straight up said, "He has made an enemy." <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to be just to be clear, because I know that the the curtain is being unveiled a little. I I still want to hear the rest of your thought, but but 
These are my, entirely my opinions that I will be sharing. <laughs> um, obviously, people can enjoy what they like. And also, I'm outvoted. This is one of the single most popular mangas and shows on my enemy list. So that's fine. As is Angel Beats. And I don't like Angel Beats. I think it's awful. So I just, I just okay. Okay. Well, but, but, you were, but you were saying, you were, you were introducing that like you're newly introduced to the Manic Pixie Dream Girl. And yeah. like, this is a whole thing. Yeah, go ahead. And go ahead. I, I didn't, I had not, <laughs> this is the first time I've equated Cowrie to Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Mm-hmm. Um, just be, but I was like, oh wait, no, this totally fits where the, the primary female character exists to bring the male character out of his sullen slump. But like, but between almost famous, uh, Elizabeth town, Scott Pilgrim, this tracks. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, yep. She's a manic pixie dream girl. That totally fits. But, you know, I, I, I I'm a sucker for emotional beats and, uh, good dialogue. And I think this had that in spades, you know, for those things. So yeah, go on. Well, well so in defense of Scott Pilgrim, uh, one of the things that I heard is important to separate the Manic Pixie Dream Girl from being a a tool for the betterment of the male lead is that the Manic Pixie Dream Girl is no longer the Manic Pixie Dream Girl when they have flaws that also they independently are seeking to overcome or could overcome separate from the lead character. So um Two examples are t- typically would be like, and also uh, do not continue to to focus on or um, celebrate the lead character despite their flaws. So like uh, Ramona Flowers does not put up with Scott and no one else does. I frankly, everyone can't stand Scott. Right. Uh, and he's, I know, I think he's like significantly more insufferable in the, in the, in the book, but, but still he's, he's brutal in the show. Uh, and the more times I watch it, the less I like him, but the more I like him as a character at the same time, it's um, I wouldn't like to know him, but I would, I very much like him as a character. Uh, Eternal sunshine, I think is the other one that's like quoted as like the anti man yes. pixie where it's like, she has her own character and she has her own problems and, and Joel cannot fix them and she cannot fix Joel. And that's, that's why the ending's so beautiful. Yeah. I, so I'll, I'll save my thoughts on Cowdy after I finish the dislikes. So I had a couple dislikes um, and I, I tempered them to ensure that we had a good pace for the episode. <laughs> so the list of dislikes, I, I put them in an order culminating with Cowdy at the end. But uh, first one was trauma. Um, similar to anybody who listened to anime episodes from last year. A- and even additionally, we did Bell, I think, in February, not in anime. I, I have yet to really watch much of this so i i criticized kyo annie animation in particular last year because i said they constantly do this extremely flowery beautiful imagery but in a way that seems pedantic as opposed to a uh, counter to trauma so my my concept of saying counter would be like a film that showcases a majority of and an a, a, a excess of beauty in a way that is aware of beauty um while simultaneously showcasing how man uh in his sin disarms beauty and, and takes advantage of beauty and in that way it's actually almost pointing a finger saying what gives you the right to do that so i think miyazaki does that really well miyazaki constantly has beauty and then also points a finger to, to man now he doesn't do it aggressively because all of his films are pretty accessible but i think princess mononoke is a good job of that too where it's like what gives you the right uh, as as eli observed in a couple episodes ago right I felt that Your Lie in April's usage of trauma kind of continued this recurrent issue I keep observing where like the child abuse plot line in the particular show just feels so, I kept using the word undercooked, but I felt like it just, I just felt wrong. I didn't feel uncomfortable. I didn't feel offended. I could totally watch the show, but I just felt like it, it, it overstepped like the acceptance of what was going on. Anime always tries to go for middle school age because uh, I know narratively, even in Japan, it works better because you're going into high school is kind of like us going into college. You're getting accepted. You're ha- you're being evaluated in ways that are very different. So that age bracket works. But that then means we're being told a 10-year-old was physically abused by their mother. And that just makes it so much harder to buy into than how Kosei reacts as a 14-year-old. And I just that was really hard for me to get into. Thankfully, in the show, about 13 episodes in, that kind of gets finished with. But it just it just rubbed me the wrong way in a way that just narratively was like, you're asking a lot of me here. Elaborate on that for me. Like, so like 
the 10 year old to 14 year old response flesh that out for me i just think like as an audience member being told that someone who's 10 years old is being physically abused is really brutal and i i recognize that a lot of anime is 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 engaged by a much more youthful audience and so i think that as an older person as a youth i when i watched anime that maybe had abuse in it i saw myself as the one being abused so then i looked forward to the time when there was catharsis of release of that but as an adult now i'm watching it going i i this feels unacceptable where's the justice because as an adult now also living in pennsylvania I am obligated if I witness any abuse to a child to, to, to I'm legally obligated to make a call. Otherwise I can go to jail too. So there's just a difference, I guess, in just being older now. I don't know. I'm trying to explore that myself here, but just like something about that felt wrong. And then also they're 14 and they're just the way they're acting as someone who experienced that kind of abuse. And then also the mother dies. So now they're left with like the unfinished work of that. Just It just narratively seemed incorrect. Um, and then I know that I, I observed online, like my anime list and other places, people criticize the balance of tone because the show tries to be very funny in the stereotypical anime way. So if you've seen anime, you know. Like the baseball comedy. stuff. and yeah. yeah. And so then doing those things just seemed confusing. Um, I know, like I said, a lot of people love the anime. So obviously it's working for some. Didn't work for me. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners, so don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. I know you mentioned a note, too, about maybe disliking the the trauma stuff. What what was it for you that, like, was affecting you? I feel like just the representation of it, but also just the, um, you know, it is the brutality of it. Like, yeah, it's harming a kid is way worse than like pretty much anything else and um like you know if it parental abuse is its own thing but you know there was just there was just so many layers added to why it sucked Mm -hmm. that you know it's like okay one it's a parent abusing a child that sucks it's a disabled parent abusing a child that's its own layer of suck it's a disabled parent that's projecting uh success and failure issues onto the child in their abuse. It's then you've got the inadequacies inadequacies and trauma that comes from that. Then the parent dies Mm -hmm. and that's unfair. And you've got the, the loss of that. Now, like I will say that, uh, you know, because I was talking with my daughter before this, you know, on the way, like when I was driving home from my (laughs) my other meeting, I was like, let me, let me rehash your thoughts on this. (laughs) And, um, the thing is that, you know, she enjoyed those aspects of it, not enjoyed like fun, but like, I understand. Yeah. She yeah. enjoyed those aspects of it because she said that as a teenager, everybody's life is unjustly messy right now. Yes. Yes. That's definitely true. <laughs> you know, she was saying with that, but also that, um, she pointed out that she really enjoyed the romance aspect of it because it was stupid and nobody did the right thing. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, she's she's like, I watch romance movies and stuff and it, it all magically works out and the teens get together. She's like, that's not what high school's like. She's like, high school is like you spend the whole time wanting somebody and they're with somebody else and then you never get to be with them. Peace out. Yeah. Yeah. They go to a different <laughs> class or maybe you just don't get scheduled right and you have no power over it and it's and it's over. The romance is done. So frustrating. Yeah, I there was um one of our early episodes, one of our early joint episodes is an episode on the Netflix movie to all the boys I'd loved before. Yeah. Great movie. So good. She loves that one. That's, that's a really good one. And uh, both of them, Lana Condor and Noah Centennial are so, so good. But Daniel, the, my co-host at the time said that like, what makes probably teen romances really enjoyable to watch is like they're written how we would want to have sounded as teenagers. Cause right. like when we're teenagers, like we don't, even now as an adult, I barely know what to say um, sometimes. So let alone being a teenager, I just want to talk about the things I'm good at. You want to talk about Call of Duty Zombies? No, because it's Thanksgiving. All right. I have nothing to talk about with you then. Sorry. Bye, Grandpa. So like, yeah, there's like, there's there's so much. Um, but I feel so much, right? And I can't figure out how to get that out. And so I can understand that. And I think that to me, like I, I could accept a lot of the dialogue and communication and the heightened communication of the of the show. But like 
as the story continues, they do talk a bit more introspectively in a way that may be a little outsized to their perspective. And then you go to the contrast of something like Neon Genesis, where they kind of almost talk exactly like they would at that age and ruin everything at the same time, too. But I think, yeah, something with the trauma plotline in particular was a little much. Um, my next criticism I had was uh, it's really repetitive. Uh, I found a lot of the plot details were belabored several times over and over. Characters, uh, I'm just going to read my note verbatim. I think this sums it up well. Characters routinely monologue about their feelings, and then those feelings don't change that often um, for a 22 minute episode or two, 22 hour, uh, gosh, <laughs> 22 episode show. Um, Similar words, visuals, and most criminally songs are also offered in Your Lie in April. There's one in particular that I really like to play a lot. Uh, and it really gets to be annoying by about episode eight. It didn't kill the show dead for me, but it will definitely try a lot of viewers if they haven't bought into the fiction yet. As I've stated before, when I say buy into the fiction, I mean, like, have, are you convinced of the story and are you gonna f- are you engaged? To me, I was having difficulty being engaged. Um, I personally had a lot of difficulty with it being 22 episodes. I probably would have th- way more enjoyed this show if it was 12 episodes. But yeah, I thought I thought it was pretty repetitive. I think you nodded too. Did you did you catch on that too? That it felt like we we're being pretty cyclical here. Well, especially with uh, Subaki. Yes, yes, that's the exact person I thought of when I wrote that too. <laughs> like, Homegirl had no character development, and she was one of the most interesting characters. <laughs> she was. She's like, boy, I like Kosei like let me be grumpy about it for like 22 episodes Uh, um and then she's like i don't care that you just went through all of these things like me she has one of the best moments i think in the show and she like she's on the beach with kosei kosei says that like i think it kosei like kosei may not overtly say at this time that he likes cowdy but he does say something that like really shocks her oh he, he's gonna go to a different college or a college a different school uh my girlfriend goes to a different school um subaki then is like totally shook runs away and she has this great line because everyone's trying to move forward and the whole show is kind of about that like moving forward looking forward and having hope and she's just like i am literally stuck in time and it just kind of just lingers on the beach and it's like the most <laughs> awful thing it's so sad because <laughs> it's like you don't know you have your whole life ahead of you and you feel like it's done you have nothing anymore it's just she's like the best character why is she stuck for 20 episodes uh <laughs> i couldn't stand it okay uh the other thing i had was just fu- forgotten or underutilized plot details i feel like i had more thoughts to say but as you can see on the note sheet i i left it blank because i didn't have much to say the one in particular here was just watari is supposed to be dating kaori but then like i'm never convinced that they like each other and i kind of wish that that was there because it would have made my heart feel stronger about kosei's interest in kaori um or even possibly kaori's interest in kosei because they stay pretty they seem platonic the whole show um, yeah. And Kosei isn't until later that he says that he's interested. I like love triangles. I like romance movies. I like romance in general. So I would have loved the like having some complications of Kosei like being interested, but being like, that's my best friend's girlfriend. I can't do that. And like even Watadi maybe being like, hey, like I'm cool with you performing with her. You can't be texting her. That's like that's inappropriate. Like I would have really loved that drama, but it's never there. Like, why are you showing thought- up at this place at the same time I am? Like, yeah, I thought that too. <laughs> <laughs> and like, even even when they have the conversation, like, okay, yeah, he's like totally fine with it. He's like, it's it's you, yeah, whatever. Like, bro, what? <laughs> so, once upon a time, the year was two thousand. I was doing a musical, Greece. I did musical theater. I had formed a romantic relationship with the young lady playing Rizzo. You fell into the curse of plays. You can't do that. <laughs> My best friend who was doing tech for that show and also had much more Riz than I did. Uh, <laughs> um, like also uh, got Rizzo's attention. And like, she was literally bouncing between the two of us. Like while we were doing this play, I suplexed my best friend, the dude who's the best man at my wedding. I suplexed my best th- friend through a porcelain countertop, <laughs> broke it, hundred dollars of damage because he was talking to a girl that I also had a crush on, and I suplexed him yeah. through a countertop. 
And these two dudes are like, oh, it's whatever. I feel like there was more <laughs> more romantic te- tension between uh, Light, Yagami, and L. Like, there was more dra- dramatic romantic tension between the two of them. And, like, they didn't like each other. So, like, it's just, like, it's, yeah, I wanted I wanted the drama. As I, as I complain about some other dramas that don't have enough, I, I wish that that was there. And uh, in terms of drama, I felt like that where it succeeded to go back to a little bit of a like, I, I realize I'm, I'm really taking up time here on this section, but, but the like that I had with drama, with drama was the, was the performances when they did the recitals. I was like, that's like the best parts of drama where I was really in it. All, all of the, the material of the show is meeting in these recitals, in these performances and contests. So to me, like that was the highlight. The the, the recital portions and all the, the backstage at the recital stuff was the best so part. So good. Far. Yeah, I love the backstage characters. They're so good. If you could trim it down to just those portions, that that can go on forever. And I'm happy with that. Yeah, it'd be super cool. Um, Yeah, all that stuff was super neat. I like that. Hey, listener, we've got a mailbag now. Open those show notes, scroll down a little, and you'll see a mailbag link. Press it and send us a text with a question and your first name, and we'll answer it in a future episode. So if any questions pop up while you're listening to the rest of this episode, you know what to do. We'd love to hear from you. Now, this is where probably the note that was frustrating, (laughs) that that, that broke the world. Um, My note here that is headlined as, uh, dislikes, cowardy, period, entirely, period. Um, so yeah, like most of these shows, there's a lot of characters, but there are specifically two leads, Kosei and Kaori. And I did not like one of these leads at all. Kaori to me was borderline insufferable. I really did not enjoy her. I found her difficult to see on screen. And I even noticed in myself that I enjoyed the episode. She specifically barely had screen time in. And I've, I'm not even lying. Like I really was like, oh, this episode's good. I think it was like six or seven. It was after the recital and, and the the initial uh, recital that they have. And I was like, this one's pretty good. It was a it was a Subaki episode, borderline. And then I was like, oh, it's because Cowdy's not here. <laughs> like I'm having a blast. And yeah, I just I could not I could not enjoy it. And so like the question is like, why? Why couldn't I like Cowdy? Um, I found her personality unenjoyable i did not like that she was very demanding uh and i feel like this is even made worse by the end of the show um we'll get into that um she's super demanding she never really asked kosei what he wants she just decides for him um she is very strong anime character in terms of like stereotype anime like aggression and like she's not soon but she's like She's got that bit to it where she's like, I want to be near you, but only by this particular way or else I'll harm you. And and the harming and the violence in the show is much more of a joke, but it's still like the show's grounded. So like it still feels like it's happening narratively. She's Manic Pixie Dream Girl for sure, because she does the thing like she does the things that are silly and crazy while she's insane. And she's like jumping off her bridge and do it. Like, do it. I just could not buy into that. I was like, if if this person was real. And I'm a Christian, I love the Lord and I want everyone to know him and I want to I want to be a friend (laughs) with everybody. I want to find a way and I want to endure a way to do so. But if this person was real. Out of all four of these lead characters would i want to spend time with her no i would find this really difficult i would be like please do not decide things for me please do not do things that are socially unacceptable and i'm not saying don't break rules i'm or like don't don't do things that you enjoy don't wear fashion you enjoy don't but like i just there was just things here that were just very difficult I, I know you said you were starting to learn a bit. Uh, you were being you were being educated in the manic pixie dream girl uh, studies uh, and getting your PhD very soon in it. But but did you did this bother you? I I killed me. It, I couldn't I I couldn't do it. I it was so hard. And it was early in the show. I was not six episodes in, and I said to my wife, "This is brutal." <laughs> So okay, you're you're gonna you're gonna like love this. I love it. Uh, like, <laughs> I don't have ibuprofen. I don't have it. So that's the thing. Like I for because the 
because the Manic Pixie Dream Girl term was first coined for Elizabethtown. Elizabethtown, yes. Yeah. And that's literally in my top 10 movies. I had a conversation with Cameron Crowe on Broadway at the almost famous premiere about Elizabethtown. Um, and he like, <laughs> he like grabbed me by the shoulders and said, not everybody gets Elizabethtown. We get a, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people do not like Elizabethtown. <laughs> and, and he said, we get Elizabethtown. And I'm like, yeah, we do. Uh, <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> because literally I, I, I ran into him on the way. Out of, I went to the opening night of almost Famous's Broadway show. Mm -hmm. I flew to New York just to do that. And he was just standing at the back, chill, like away from everybody. And I was like, didn't want to draw a crowd. I was like, Hey, I just want to let you know, I love everything you've done. Or not everything. I love a lot of what you've done. Um, almost, <laughs> I said, Almost Famous is my favorite movie, but I said that Elizabethtown helped me get through the death of my parents. And and we talked about that for a second. That's when he did the Elizabethtown thing. That's funny. So Elizabethtown's always been important to me. So somebody sent me the Manic Pixie Dream Girl art thing because they knew I loved Elizabethtown. And I saw those three <laughs> titles of Almost Famous, Elizabethtown, yep. and Scott Pilgrim. I'm like, holy crap, I've got a thing. And I was like, and I, yeah. think I was like, and I was like, oh, I like Manic Pixie Dream Girls. Yes. <laughs> and and like and so like watching this was like, this is my alley. I enjoy this. Like like so apparently that's something I enjoy. And like that says a lot about what I need to self in like introspect and like check myself with. But like <laughs> but awesome. in terms of characters, exposed. I like yeah, I'm totally exposed there. Um I like Manic Pixie Dream Girl characters. And so be and like I straight up had zero beef with her. You know what? I was more annoyed by Subaki. Yeah, I'm looking at some a list of manic pixie dream girls. Uh, 500 Days of Summer, Forgetting right. Sarah Marshall, uh, yep. Elizabeth Town. Um, this person inappropriately has Eternal Sunshine. That is 100% inaccurate. Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist. Sounds <laughs> good. Ruby Sparks. Oh, obviously, uh, Ruby Sparks. That makes sense. Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. That one totally works. Blazing through the next few, um, we have recurring symbols and iconography, motifs, instrumentation, catchphrases. The the real the number one thing that I most observed, and I felt like that is pretty much the one everyone will notice is everyone keeps having these recurrent lines of like, I want to reach them, I want to reach them, and it's always whenever they're playing music or doing some sort of artistic endeavor, they want to complete this particular thing and they want to reach a particular person. Um, it's set up pretty early on in the show that like people will if they have somebody that they're doing the thing for it becomes more valuable or more palatable or more powerful and so that's what they do and uh yeah what, what how did you interpret or approach or observe the i want to reach them idea i felt like a lot of the for the most part a lot of the reaching was kind of selfish actually you know like when you boil it down to it like uh not necessarily actually seeing where they were. They just wanted to be reached so that they would be able to actually give them what they wanted. Like, I feel like Subaki wanted to reach Kosei just for the fact that she wanted Kosei. Mm -hmm. I feel like Kaori wanted to reach Kosei for his own good, but also like in a controlling way. Yes. Yeah. Like, I feel like she wanted to heal his trauma, but also like not in a, not necessarily a healthy way. Which is just, you know, really reflective when you're dealing with the fact that her handling his trauma with control when control is what gave him his trauma. Yeah. What was up with that? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, and I, I, get, I, I get that, that too. I caught that too. <laughs> and, and I think I think that's the thing about, you know, Manic Pixie Dream Girls is like we want some like people that respond to that. Um are waiting for someone else to magically show up and make their world better. Yes. Yeah. And, like logic be darned. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. It's like, it doesn't have to make sense. Just show up and make my life better. It's codependency. It is. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, And you know, it's codependency with no accountability. Just come fix everything. Yeah. I, I also sort of caught up on that, that like this, I want to reach them. It's sort of constructed out of a way of like, I want to give to them and let them know, but it, at least that's how I feel that the show is portraying it. But like, I really felt it so similarly to you where it was sort of selfish, where it's like, for my sake, hear me is kind of what's being proposed. And I think like, in a way, like if the show is about growing into independence, then I feel like that to me would be quite compelling. How do I continue this thought without spoilers? 
Is it time? It's time. It, it's time, dude. It's time. Uh, we're going to open up into spoilers so we can continue these thoughts more specifically. So if you've seen the show, keep listening, please. <laughs> if you haven't seen the show and you don't care, keep listening, please. Um, so the at the end of the show, we get this... Um, We'll we'll set it up later too, but basically, Cowdy from the medical condition ends up dying, and she then has this moment where she ends the show as Kose reads a letter that Cowdy wrote for him. So to me, I felt like the whole show is building this idea of I want to reach them as like it's being sold as something where we're connecting and that's a good thing for the both of us. But then it feels like actually it's a selfish thing. And then the ending is confirming that it actually thinks it's actually good for other people. But in reality, I'm listening to this, this letter where she's saying, I lied to this guy. So I took advantage of him to get to you. And then we saw how how she treated him, which is constantly telling him what to do and being a manipulator and being kind of nasty and, and and not I, I didn't find her very kind and so like when she, when the film when the story is sending her off as if romantically to me i'm like kose has gone from one traumatic experience to another traumatic experience in which he has experienced stockholm syndrome from a manic pixie dream girl and has been taken advantage of and now is going to have to have a season two where she ha- he has to learn to break free <laughs> of this experience and you have this like almost like a parasite who entered this who who even says in their letter that they were parasitic i don't it's just like that they came into this friendship that they weren't supposed to be a part of i just it didn't it didn't work for me, man. It something was wrong. And this like, I want to reach them thing. I felt like really ties together what doesn't work in a broad sense. And then the specifics we'll get into later. Hey there, listener. Want to influence the podcast? Head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support the show for $3 a month. In doing so, you'll be able to vote on a movie poll that picks a film we discuss each month. So jump on over there and have your voice heard. So, so, so with the letter and the thing at the end, like to me, the whole heart of it is um, she knew where she was physically. She knew she probably wasn't going to make it. So she didn't want to emotionally entangle him. So the lie wasn't, you know, just about, you know, what Tabi, the lie is, I actually do like you, but I don't want you to get hurt. So I'm going to keep my distance until I'm dead. Razzle dazzle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So like, I feel like it was less i get the parasitic element but i feel like it was less the parasitic element and more of uh i'm guarding your heart so that you don't end up loving me while i'm alive and you can just mourn my memory which is its own form of everything else but sure i understand it's like uh it's like a um it's similar to the mother in that i would just say it's manipulative manipulative uh emotional abuse in that she is thinking she's making the right choice But in my opinion, doing it in a way that's very wrong. Now, I recognize, yeah, they're 14. And I think I do think it's actually a pretty astute observation that your your daughter has where it's like, well, they're also just like kids. They're making the wrong choices. And that kind of makes it kind of wonderful to watch. And in that way, like, I think if I could bear it, I personally would have enjoyed it more. But there was just, yeah, it just it was really upsetting to me. Even like, and I, I've even said it on the podcast. I like stories about people who lie. Um, I like stories where it starts with a big lie, but the person's having to balance the fact that the lie is getting worse. But usually, the ending is the lie bites them back and showcases that even small lies, as they overmount, like are really awful. I just felt that this story, in the way it was ending, was treating the lie as like, but it all worked out in the end. And I just, I really. Man, it's like the lie was the favor. The lie was the act of love because I was lying to you to protect you. Like, God forbid, Watari gets this letter and reads it, right? And is like, she didn't like me? Like, what if he liked her? <laughs> like, that would be so upsetting. <laughs> I, I, I hear you. But at no point did Watari ever give the vibe of, oh, I actually care. Like, that was never there. I suppose. Yeah. But then it's also like, but then why? I just kept thinking, though, like, other than you wanted to do a twist, right? You didn't want to have it be the lie that she said she was healthy 
in the beginning of the show because everyone knows she's not healthy. That's not the story from the first episode, you know, like, okay, she's dead. Uh, It's like, just fine. But like, other than making the twist be actually my lie was that I'm into Watari. I just, I don't know. It felt, it felt cruel in a way that like, didn't quite understand that it was so cruel. And I feel like my whole experience with the show was a constant usage. And I'm criticizing more the writer here that like, I feel like the writer kept utilizing tools that it didn't, that they didn't at the time perhaps know how to use them. The weight of child abuse, the weight of lying, the weight of romance, um, the weight of PTSD. It just seemed, it seemed inappropriate, irresponsible even. And yeah, in, in this place, but I digress. Moving into, Prominent significant moments, which will combine with the ending because they're roughly the same. Were there any particular moments in the show? You were starting to talk about one, but were there any particular moments in the show you wanted to talk about? The the cat scene, mm-hmm. like um, the cat that he found in the street and chased yes. and that got hit by the car and everything else. I felt like that was a really good non cowy related moment of him and his trauma and everything else with that. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was a really good, you know, not calorie centric moment of him healing and just recognizing his own trauma in those capacities. I also really liked Kosei's like a influence on the other pianists, like the other backstage crew. Yeah. 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 Like I forgot the names, but yeah, I like, yeah, same. Um, (laughs) But like the people that were like trying to aspire to him, like they looked at him like he was the, like the end all beat all challenge and he was barely functioning. And I'm like, how many times are we just showing up like barely existing and people view us as threats. Um, but like, I really liked the, the kind of a iron sharpens iron vibe of like really challenging those people to actually want to be more, even though that wasn't his goal, which he consistently does. Um, including to Cowdy, as we learn in the ending that like he, he doesn't know it about himself, but his proficiency and talent that he has trained, even at the expense of abuse from his from his mother, has become an inspiration to several people um, who want to play like him, have the commu- talent like him, and ostensibly like the communication like him through he does, which he does through his music, which is pretty cool. I think that's a neat idea. Let me throw this at you, not not to disar- not to argue like your <laughs> view of Cowry, but to say this: watching someone else love something makes it more beautiful. Totally. And so, watching Cowry, sorry, watching Kose love Cowry, even on a platonic sense, made whatever flaw she had a little more buffered. And like his dialogue towards the end, like like in their like his reflective moments of uh he said this every moment I spend with her is like a roller coaster. She is the journey with no clear destination in sight. It's like your freedom itself. And she says freedom is what we find out there. And it's just like like moments like that, just watching how he responded to her, like I feel made like his response to her made me enjoy her more. Like, because I guess, you know, not outside of the whole Manic Pixie Dream Girl vibe is watching how he was affected by her. Because even regardless of like her intentions or, you know, positive, negative else, he came out better on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. He'll have future trauma, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. he's he's better off than when the story started in terms of trauma than, you know, with his mom and everything else. Yeah. To like trunk, there's to kind of cut down one of the thoughts I had, because as you're describing that, I'll, I can apply it here. There is a sense in which, broadly speaking, we there, there's like two responses to wrongdoing. There's civil, uh, three, there's four. Okay, there's four. There's vengeance. <laughs> you try to get revenge on someone. That's wrong. Yeah. There's justice. That is, th- through government and legal means, something takes place. Civility, which is like passive... For forgiveness. It's not real forgiveness, but it's more like you wronged me, but for the sake of betterment moving forward. So not for that person or even for myself, but the betterment of everything, let's continue to move forward. And then there's like Christ, right? Which is like, you have wronged me. Christ loves me. I'm going to endure this wrong because someday I want you to know Christ. Um, or perhaps they've repented, right? And And that person repents and comes to you and says like, I wronged you. And you can be like, I forgive you because of Christ. 
I I think like for me, like you that works in a real sense, but to me, like those things are hard for me to to apply to Cowdy because I've just found her so unrealistic. Cowdy is less a character and more of an ideal, which is the manic pixie dream girl. It's not a real person. The girl doesn't exist. It's her fantasy, the fantasy version of, of what she wants. She loves you. She adores you. She wants what's better for you. Also, she's really pretty and she's like a size two. So like, like there are things about this. Dude, thing there's that, not a fat person in this movie or not, in the show. Not in any Jebedee's anime, roughly, <laughs> except for like a, a couple. But there's something like that to that. Like, I think like if the show was more... If it wanted to explore the things that I feel like you're describing, I would have to see her as a real person. But if I see her as an idea, it's like, of course, I can resolve problems with an idea. I'll just think about it. <laughs> but like, but I find people more complicated and frustrating. Um, and I think that that's sensible to say because people are. Uh, but I also find people more beautiful. And so like a lot of the beauty that I feel like is being described about her, I can't see. But I only see frustration because I, I have difficulty believing that it's real. I know I'm like I'm I'm being cyclical myself, just like the show. <laughs> Been itching for Cinematic Doctrine merch? Check out the support tiers on Patreon. We're offering merch to those who support at select tiers. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and share your support. There's a link in the show notes too. So, so let me ask you in conjunction with all this, like on the manic pixie dream girl level, dealing with her own stuff with her, does her medical condition, her family relationship with her parents and her own kind of self-sacrifice as a character, does that counteract the manic pixie dream girl stuff in her, in your mind? It's a good question. Because if, if you look at her like an actual sick teenager with parents that are like watching her suffer and her going out of her way to try and bring a little life to the one guy that she is focused on. Does it shift her story at all as a manic PC dream girl? Cause she's got more problems than Cowrie and she's actually kind of dealing or more problems than Kose mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. And she's actually is like the, the scene uh, where she's going through it and saying, you know, like I'm going through with this surgery. Like, I, you know, in, it'll probably kill me, but I'm doing it anyway. Her parents are begging her not to that whole situation. I, I totally get the the negative qualities, but like looking at her, if you were to remove Kose or sorry, yeah, remove Kose, remove like her interactions with him and just look at her as a young lady going through illness pl with musical stuff like that. Does it change anything for you? So if I. If I went the extreme and I said like yeah remove him from the equation uh, oh, yeah but I, but I feel like if he's in the equation narratively she is only there and only frankly suffering in a way that's sad for his benefit narratively um because he experiences virtually the same thing that he experienced with his mother but now with a peer including the the scene where like they start arguing and she's getting mad at him and is like why are you here go practice why are you hanging out with me go practice there's a wide shot where you see the characters watching this awkward interaction and you're like it's the same thing again she's he is reliving now quite literally the experience with the mother and man, criticizing her is more me criticizing the author's usage of her. Right, wherein, right. like, I felt like if the author wanted to breathe life into this character, she needs to have other things at stake other than even her romance with Kosei. I, I just, I, and I found that, I just found that unhelpful um, for myself um, while watching the story to, like, just see this person suffer, but for the betterment of a character that I don't know, doesn't himself even have really independence. Um, it feels like, cause he, even when he wasn't being blessed around by her, he then gets another teacher who then says like, you're going to do this. And he's like, what? Okay, sure. And so I kind of just observe like the whole show is like, Kose is an audience stand in and he will do whatever the story tells him to do just as the audience will do whatever the audience is told to do by the show as they watch it you're going to see these colors on the screen you're going to 
feel this emotion you're gonna just like good that's like the point of watching movies that is the existence of film as a storytelling um but then like Cality then existed and was constructed not for even Kose really but for you not you but like the audience it was for the audience and like I just I don't know I don't press play to be told like here's your girlfriend, you know? Oh, and we're going to kill her at the end. I just, something about that just doesn't feel right. I, to me, uh, again, 8.4 out of 10 on my anime list out of aggregation, 4.1 on letterbox. People love this stuff. I, I just couldn't get, I couldn't get it. And I want to, like I said, I went into it (laughs) wanting to, like, I want to cry, but yeah, we've been at this a while. Any, any, um, Final thoughts you have on your lie in April? Any final thoughts on my seriously negative criticism <laughs> that will definitely <laughs> never gain a listener from one of your family members? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely not going to tell her where to listen to this. Um, oh, I think I would <laughs> genuinely be interested in hearing what she has to say because uh, she, technically she'd be right in what she thinks. I would, that's the joy of <laughs> storytelling. <laughs> it is the joy of storytelling. Um, <laughs> I like so I think for me outside of the manic pixie dream girl thing I feel like this show provides the same thing Elizabeth Town provides which is catharsis mm-hmm. if you're dealing with loss um if you're dealing with trauma I feel like it's something that can be really cathartic like for me um when I miss my parents or when I miss my grandmother or things like that watching Elizabeth Town is my go to mm mm-hmm. Um, just because it is a story about losing your parents and a story about uh, finding or recognizing that loss when you weren't even appreciating their presence, stuff like that. So I, that's my cathartic movie. I also have like, um, I have movies that I just want to feel the stuff that goes with it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like loss of life and feeling stuck romantically and things like that uh, i feel like this is a good one just for in terms of anguish and those things and i feel like i feel like it provides catharsis more than anything mm-hmm. and um which is why i feel like you know in terms of like crying or tears like that it's just the loss of it like was what really hit me i think if you're you the batting average for the show is pretty high and I, I know people did not like my thoughts on uh, The Silent Voice last year. So people will probably enjoy your line in April as well, since they also like The Silent Voice. I think, uh, I think the show has a lot to discuss. Absolutely. Um, and because it's also been watched by a lot of people in that respect, I think that that opens up a lot of conversation to be had with other people, which is one of my favorite things to encourage is that like the most interesting things to talk about are honestly the ones that I want to watch and promote on the show. And so I think 22 episodes, if you, if you do find that you've consistently aligned like 90% with how I feel about stuff, you probably will not enjoy this. But if you do enjoy like classical music, you enjoy some drama, you enjoy some heavy themes being played with, um, there, there's a lot to chew on in here. If you enjoy Manic Pixie Dream Girls. And if you enjoy Manic Pixie. Um, and uh, otherwise, at the very least, it's going to be a pretty low score in Letterboxd. <laughs> but that's all right. My score won't mean anything on this thing. Everyone loves it. Want some quick updates on the podcast? Follow the Cinematic Doctrine Instagram for cool posts and story updates. Press the link in the show notes or search Cinematic Doctrine, that's one word, in your Instagram app. Oh, and we're on threads. Check us out there, too. Oh, man. Okay. So what do you, uh, going into recommendations, the end of the show, you can recommend anything you want, but I usually recommend whatever's your favorite thing that you watched recently. What do you recommend, Hector? I love Delicious in Dungeon. It's delightful and it's fun. It's straight up my favorite thing to watch right now. The The general plot is a main character dies. The whole party has to start over at the top of the dungeon. And uh, if they can make it to back to where they died, or if they can make it back to the dragon, they can save the little sister who was eaten by a dragon before she's digested. So it's all food related. <laughs> it's, it's all food related. But the thing that the, the big print plot premise is you have to have so much money and so much food to be able to actually survive in the dungeon. 
uh, and make it that far. They don't have any money. They don't have any food. So they find a dwarf with a cookbook for monsters. And cool. so they make it through the dungeon by killing monsters and then learning how to cook them. And so they'll be in the middle of a big Dungeons and Dragons battle. And then it turns into a cooking show. First, we're going to cool. mince this, this. And then it like presents it. It does the little money shot of the dish. Like, da, da, da. <sighs> that's awesome. <laughs> but they keep adding characters to the party. They keep adding elements to the storytelling. Um, and then they get to a poor, a piece and like an, a climactic episode around episode 12 that kind of feels like oh the show's over psych it's so far from over and it continues nice the animes are the manga's already done but uh it's that genuinely is my favorite thing to watch right now above like x-men 97 just finished and that was great but i wasn't surprised by that i was surprised by delicious and dungeon i'm gonna recommend I I realize I now have like two recommendations because of how we started this discussion. When you when you asked how would they like picture music on a page, it reminded me of a manga I remember reading. So I'm going to briefly mention two things. So one is a manga. I don't know where it's printed because I read this back in the day when I didn't buy everything. <laughs> so it was uh, just on. It just was magically on the internet. I, yeah, that's yes. <laughs> Uh, someone just took photos with their camera and sent them to me. Um, this manga is called, I'm not going to even bother with the Japanese name because it's a little out of my wheelhouse, but the um, English name is Our Happy Hours. It is one volume, eight chapters. I'm going to read this premise to you. Uh, Juri Muto is the daughter of a once famous pianist whose career came to an end after giving birth to her. After a traumatic event she experienced as a teenager, Juri has attempted suicide three times and has come to hate her mother with her life clouded due to her dark past. Her aunt Monica, a member of the clergy, invites her to visit a, con a convict sentenced to death. Yu is a death row inmate charged with murdering three people, leading to many attempts to ending his own life within his own jail cell. He frequently receives letters from Monica, who have hopes to help him, but sees this as an act of pity. But when Yu decides to meet Monica to say that he wants her to stop sending letters, which is funny, he encounters Jury, a meeting that would change both of their lives. This is one volume that that premise is obviously very heavy. I have never wept so hard reading a manga or even a novel. It is so life affirming. It is so beautiful. The artwork here is amazing. You will hear music at the end. Um, this is amazing. It is basically it's it's almost more basically just a a. Uh, borderline philosophical conversation about just two people who are sad who didn't ask to be born and are stuck and it's like it's a very interesting and it's not philosophical by any means it's just talking but they definitely represent this like sense of power and and misery it's just it's really beautiful stuff and i i absolutely recommend it um i feel like for me, it would be the mouthwash in response to your line, April. I just, I find, I just, this is so wonderful. So I really recommend that. Um, I will link it in the show notes, at least the title or the My Anime List link, just so you know where it is in terms of like, I don't know, encyclopedia. You'll have to find where to get it after that. Um, then the actual thing I'm going to recommend, which is an anime, um, is called Say I Love You. It's a romance, teen romance from a couple of years ago. <laughs> I say that, but it's actually probably over 10 years old now. So now I feel old. Um, but it is the premise is very simple. Uh, guy meets girl meets guy through a simple meet cute. And then it turns out to be much more of a, a very grounded, realistic romance story about high schoolers they're not 14 they are 18 or 19 or 17 um and they all actually look it too because this was before moe blobs took over the industry and you basically learn about how the the shy girl and the really cool guy become interested in each other there's all these much more complicated characters throughout the story as well there's 13 episodes and there is an episode that is an ova that is not on the blu-ray so you'll have to find that as well um, and it basically ends the show uh, as they all head off to college. Um, but yeah, it's I, I I love it. I think about this frequently. I've been meaning to rewatch it myself. It's very good. Um, so definitely check it out. Link in the show notes as well for that Just Watch link. Hector, thanks so much for joining me on this very, let's call it, full episode of the podcast um to let, let our listeners know where they can uh, find you <laughs> um on all the socials at faith and fandom emotional support hobbit on tiktok 
Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and uh, but like faithandfandom.org for uh, all the devotionals and links to basically everything else. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once-a-month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.